Hey everyone, it's Nightharrow here, and today I have my Nightblade healer guide for you. So it's been a long time coming, I'm sorry about that, but let's go ahead and talk about it. Why would you want to play a Nightblade healer? Well, first up, Minor Savagery. Minor Savagery is a unique buff that increases the weapon damage of your group by 10%, and you can't get it anywhere else in the game. The only other comparable thing you can get is the Magicka version from a different class. And I, I can't remember which, if it's a Templar or a Sorcerer, so one of those two, don't quote me. <laughs> other reasons you might want to play a Nightblade, besides the unique buff that you absolutely need in a group, and since Nightblade DPS isn't super high, uh, a tank or a healer is the way to go right now. It's going to be with Catalyst, will give you an extra 20 ultimate generation every time you drink a potion, which can be quite nice. You also do fairly good, just raw heals, because you have so many things that increase your critical and just other things that kind of the net result is just increased raw heals right there's several different things soul siphon magicka flood that kind of stuff which are some passives in the skill line which gives you more magicka and just simply increased percent healing by three percent per skill so lots of reasons to recommend a night blade reasons you might want to night not run a night blade well you know a lot of times you'll find yourself running just you know generic heals so as far as like having a class feel to it i feel like the night blade healer has lacks in that area somewhat there's not a whole lot of night blade ability that really do a, um, an amazing job healing. Sure, there's refreshing path. Sure, there's healthy offering. But in general, those aren't nearly as uh, significant as some of the other class heals that, that are out there, especially with when we talk about something like a uh, warden or an arcanist. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move on and talk about some of these skills. So first up here is going to be healthy offering. Healthy offering is our single target burst heal. So if you need a single target burst heal for anything in particular, Generally speaking, that's going to be a healing check. You can always use combat prayer, but healthy offering actually works quite well. In addition, healthy offering actually buffs all of our heals by giving us that minor mending. Minor mending increases our healing done by 8%. And so that just allows all of our heals to do a little bit more. It only lasts for 10 seconds. You actually, it actually can be worth it to keep this buff up just because that 8% extra healing is fairly significant. But in general, you'll just leave it on your bar. Just by having a skill from the siphoning skill line on your bar, Bar. Each skill will give you 3% extra healing done, so that's nice to have. It will also provide us with 8% more max magicka, which gives us the equivalent of weapon and spell damage. So again, just by having the seal on our bar, we need just one of them for this ability, the magicka flood. It will increase our max magicka and therefore increase all of our healing done. And we'll talk about ways of moving stuff around in, in a little bit once we kind of go through all the skills. Moving on from there, we have illustrious healing or healing springs. I think that there are uses for both of these heals. One of them lasts for a shorter amount of time, but also gives you a lot more recovery. This can be useful in very mobile fights where, you know, people aren't going to be staying in the same place very often anyways. So it can, you're constantly recasting. And when it is down, it will give you a bit of recovery, something you could use potentially in like somewhere like cloud rest, for example. But if you're just going to not remorph this whenever you need to leave it, leave it as a luxurious healing. That's the way to go. It just lasts a little bit longer. And particularly on a night blade, we have so many buffs that are relatively short. We run out of global cooldowns to be able to cast and keep up all of our various heal over times and buffs and everything like that. After that, we have combat prayer. Combat prayer on all healers is your main go-to heal. If you need a burst heal, it's combat prayer. The reason for that is because it's a good heal. It, he it heals in an AOE. For those who don't know, all heals only apply to six targets, so it won't hit everybody in your group. You might have to hit it a couple of times, but combat prayer is your burst heal. It also applies minor berserk, which increases your group's damage by 5%. So again, you have to, it only hits six people, so you do have to cast this multiple times every time you cast it to get that buff on the party and it lasts for 10 seconds and it also provides minor resolve minor resolve is something your tank will be counting on you to generally provide for them and it also reduces your damage taken by your group which is very useful and something you absolutely want in your group after that we have echoing vigor echoing vigor is just a really nice sticky hot it lasts for 16 seconds this is another one again it's only going to apply to part of your group so you are going to need to cast this twice to hit everybody in your group and even if they move outside of the area, that's what I mean by sticky hot, it will stay on them. So in particularly mobile fights where you're grouped up and then people are moving, this can be very useful to keep a little bit of heal on your group since most of our primary dots are ground-based. So if they're moving out of them all the time, those aren't gonna be as useful. Echoing Vigor is a great way to go. And it's something that a lot of people just swear by and they never leave their bar. Now you could move this to your back bar in certain situations and put some other bar on your front one. Keep that in mind, This, but, but generally speaking, you usually wanna run Echoing Vigor. 
After that, we have Mass Hysteria. Mass Hysteria, this is a flex bot, and, and it's all in all my builds. Whenever you see a flex bot, guys, you can put anything there that you might need to, all right? I, I try to put what might make sense to keep there if you're not running that skill, but just keep in mind, flex bots are there to be, put anything you need, put it there. Uh, Mass Hysteria only lasts for 10 seconds, but it applies major cowardice. Major cowardice being the opposite of, of, of major courage and so it reduces our enemies weapon and spell damage now on certain boss fights it varies how much weapon and spell damage they have but on a lot of them this is a fairly significant damage reduction now it only lasts for 10 seconds and we have a bunch of other abilities to keep up and so if you're new or if you're not running really hard hitting content i generally speaking would still not run mass hysteria it's a great skill it's really useful to use but reducing the damage done if you're dropping off all of your heals and everything else like that it's not going to be worth it and it would be better to go with something that you're either going to use as a passive here or as like a longer duration heal over time or something would be better but on really hard hitting fights mass hysteria can come quite in handy and, and does really well for our ultimate of course we have reviving barrier generally we keep this here for the passive but if you ever need to if, if people are dying and you need to get a res or something else you can always pop that to hopefully help keep your group alive or ideally in a situation where you know a bunch of damage is coming in and you can kind of do it preemptively a bit to keep anybody from dying now moving on to our back bar and then we'll come back and talk about all these different flex spots so on our back bar of course we have our wall of elements this is just helps keep our back bar enchant even when we're on our front bar. So it generally doesn't leave our bar. Some healers will run double resto staffs in certain situations. Generally speaking on a night blade, I would not recommend that. You really want to run a destro staff. You need to be able to do a little bit of damage and our wall of elements to keep to keep up that minor savagery buff and so wall of elements is a great way to do that you need to crit at least once every 20 seconds to keep that buff up which is pretty easy but you do need some damaging skills on your bar and light attacking you know while that can do the trick i wouldn't necessarily count on it in all situations you might drop up times after that we have siphoning strikes siphoning strikes this is actually getting buff next patch so it'll work whether on a front bar or back bar and this skill basically when we light attack will give us recovery, 200 magic and stamina, as well as healing us for a little bit. The main reason we're using this is for the extra recoveries. And again, just a really nice skill to have. You do wanna be light attacking as a healer, light attack weaving as often as you can. It's even more important on a night blade than it is on any other healing class. So keep that in mind. After that, we have another flex buy here and refreshing path is typically what I would run. Refreshing path provides a bit of a heal over time, comparable to most of our other heals. So works quite well. It also provides us with minor recovery recoveries. So that increases our stamina and our magical recovery, which you always need in group. The thing is that you all, you basically always have this in group now because you're always going to have Xena's disc that provides that minor courage. And so if you have that, this also provides those minor recovery buffs. So you won't need path. Now path also provides us with major expedition, which increases everybody who's in the path. And then for like a sec couple of seconds after they leave with major expedition, increasing their speed by 30%. That doesn't seem like that huge of a deal, but it actually can have some utility. One in trash running from point A to point B, if you don't have a tank running rapids, can be quite nice. Uh, also in Zalvaka, when you're moving from one floor to the other, there are other places as well, Kinds Aegis and other stuff where this can be useful. So just keep that in mind, reasons you might want to run that skill besides it just being a decent heal over time. After that, we have our energy orb. Energy orb provides the entire group with, with a synergy, which is really nice to have, especially since we're all running Arcanist right now. And that can be really hard for uh, your tanks and for your Alkosh DPS and for other people to have enough synergies. So it does a good job of that. It also provides a good heal over time. Most heals, just FYI, heal for about the same amount or fairly comparable amounts or for, you know, twice as much, but half as often or something like that. They are different. Energy Orb is definitely on the higher on the list, but most heals heal for about the same amount. It does slowly travel. That can be a feature or a bug, <laughs> depending on if you want it to travel or not. Uh, but again, just a really nice heal and usually you wouldn't take it off your bar. After that is Relentless Focus. This might seem a little odd to those who know Nightblade because this is definitely a DPS skill. However, we need a skill from this skill line to keep up our Minor Savagery. Minor Savagery procs when we have an assassination skill on our skill bar and we deal critical damage, okay? So we do have to have a skill from that skill line on our bar. There are several 
several options. We'll talk about that when we go through all the different flex spots here in a second, but we need something on our bar. The reason we like Relentless Focus though is because especially with the next patch, we're not gonna have to cast it at all. Just by being on our bar and by light attack weaving, it will increase our weapon and spell damage by 400. So pretty significant increase, which will increase our healing done. So if we have to pick one of those skills, we don't have a lot of great options. So this not only does it help us keep up that minor savagery, but it also increases our weapon spell and spell damage, which increases our total healing done. And it's really nice that we also don't have to cast it. So that's also pretty cool. But you could flex this out as long as you put another skill from the assassination skill line on your bar. And then last up here is gonna be Aggressive Warhorn. So generally speaking, we're gonna be running Aggressive Warhorn. That's the ultimate we're gonna be using. It just provides a lot of bonus resources which equate to max damage for our party as well as giving them increased critical damage, which they're kind of counting on. So, you know, nothing else really needs to be said. All right, now let's talk about uh, some different ways of doing this. So we talked about a couple of things. One of them is having something like Healthy Offering, something from the Siphoning skill line, on our bar, on each bar, because of Magicka Flood giving us 8% total max Magicka. Now, we could just front bar this for more heals, but I personally, since we want siphoning strikes on our bar anyways, I would tend to run one on each bar, and then we don't have to worry about our Magicka dropping 8%, depending on what bar we're on, and helps us a little bit more with, with just making sure we have enough Magicka, because it, it will just go away. It won't be like you gain it and then you lose it. It just goes away, and then you have to recover it like normal, which could mess a little bit with your sustain. There are arguments to be made for both ways. This is just what I happen to recommend. The other thing is, of course, the Soul Siphoned passive, which is what gives us that 3% increased heal per skill on our bar. So again, some some people prefer to stack all of these skills on their front bar. I don't really think it's necessary. And again, I tend to run one on each bar, but again, just know that there's arguments for both of these things to be made. And then of course, hemorrhage, the hemorrhage passes is what gives us that minor savagery. It also gives us an extra 10% critical damage, which is also critical healing. So there are reasons why you might want to have that extra critical healing on your front bar, because that's quite a bit of healing you would, you would have, especially in a trial setting, a little bit less so in like a dungeon setting. So what can you do here? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about it. Well, we have a couple of ultimates from both of these skill lines that we could put on our bar. I will note the assassination ultimates will not be useful as passives moving into the next patch. Currently, whenever you light attack, they give you back more resources. That's all being moved to siphoning attacks. So you won't, that won't provide you with any benefit. However, you might need the bar space <laughs> and we don't always need the magic or recovery from our reviving barrier from passives in that skill line. So instead we might put an assassination ultimate here to provide us with that buff or at least the buff to our group of minor savagery which is to increase damage. Now, if we already have that on our bar because we're running Relentless Focus, then instead what we can do is run something from the Siphoning Skill line. So as I already have here, Healthy Offering, uh, you could also run the ultimate here, Soul Tether. Soul Tether actually provides a significant amount of healing. It's just over a very short period of time, so it's often not very useful. It would be better if it just lasted longer and perhaps provided a little bit less healing or spread that healing out over that time, but it is what it is. Just putting it on your bar though, if you don't need recovery, will give you 3% extra increase raw heals while on that bar. So you could use that to stack more bonus healing on your front bar. Another thing you could do is run Lotus Fan. Lotus Fan provides us with min minor vulnerability and an AOE. No other skill that I'm aware of does that in the game. You can get a single target, but if you have multiple primary targets or if you're in trash or something, running Lotus Fan, which is from the assassination skill line, which will proc that minor savagery, you could put it on your front bar. And again, you can see if you do that, you need some skill from the, the siphoning skill line here. And so that's when you would slot in your ultimate. Another thing you could do is you could move relentless focus from our back bar to our front bar. The reason you would want to do that is for the increased critical damage. So, which is again, going to apply to critical healing as well. It's just often referred to as one thing as critical damage. So you could move that to your front bar. Again, you're not going to use it, but just by being on our bar, it's going to give us that increase critical healing. So you can see there's reasons why you might want to swap everything out. In general, you don't need to run an assassination skill on both bars. And in general, I would recommend running a siphoning skill on both bars. So you can kind of see how you might want to swap all these skills out depending on what your personal needs are. Hopefully all that was clear. Now moving on, we have radiating regeneration. Radiating, re radiating regeneration is just a nice heal over time. The problem with this in large group content is it only heals a couple of people and it doesn't last very long. So you kind of use it as a semi-spammable in certain areas where everybody's spread out, like in Veteran Asylum Sanctorum 
or if you're in a dungeon, because <laughs> no one will ever stack for you. But in general, if you're an organized group content and people are actually standing in one spot, it's usually better not to run this skill. So just keep that in mind. Moving on to our back bar, these flex skills on our back bar could really go anywhere. So we have first off crushing shock. This is not something I would tend to slot in this spot, but if you need a ranged interrupt, crushing shock is the way to go. And it's from the destruction staff skill line, can be really crucial whenever you do need it. And then we have Overflowing Altar. Overflowing Altar provides a center two to all of our allies in a huge radius. It also applies minor lifesteal, but that's not really that significant. The main thing is that if they go low health, they can use the synergy from this, this to heal themselves for 65% of their max health. And if it crits, it'll heal them for like 100% of their health. Okay, so it's a full health bar. So this is really nice for your tanks in particular, but it can also be nice for your DPS in, in dungeon settings where everybody's spread out and they're not stacked to heal so that if they do get in, in, a, in trouble, they can heal themselves. Now synergies have a 20 second cooldown, so they can only do it so often, but it is really nice to have. And, and they can heal themselves a second or two before you could even react too. So that's the other really nice thing about this. They take a bunch of damage. This will synergy will pop up to the top of the stack. They hit it. It's off global cooldown. So there's no weight and they're instantly healed for a huge amount. As opposed to they take a bunch of damage. You notice they take a bunch of damage. You find them and then cast healing on them, which is at least going to take a second or two and might take quite a bit longer. So that's why we like overflowing altar and any group content someone should be running overflowing altar. If it's not the tank, if it's not the other healer, usually it should be a healer, uh, then it should be you. So just keep that in mind. Now moving on to some of our flex spots over here. We have quite a few. Some of these I mentioned just because they're very niche, but when you do want them, you absolutely need them. Others are per perhaps have a little bit more utility, so we'll just run through them quickly. First up here is going to be Efficient Purge. Efficient Purge cleanses you and all of your allies, not all of them, but many of your allies around you. And it's a very crucial, it's on the PVP skill line that you level this up and that you get it morphed because the other morph costs like 8,000 Magicka. And this is already super expensive, more than any other skill at like at like 5,000 or, or 4,500 or something. So it's already incredibly, or maybe it's 5,500. It's already incredibly expensive, even fully morphed and fully leveled, uh, but you absolutely want to get it and get it fully maxed out because in the few places you do need it, it's, it's absolutely critical you have it. After that, we have Bone Surge. Bone Surge is another one of the skills that is incredibly useful whenever you need it and not useful any other time. So <laughs> whenever you cast a skill, it actually provides you with a shield, which is kind of nice. But the more important thing, it provides a synergy to your allies and they have to be stacked right on top of you for the synergy. But if they hit that, it actually provides a shield for them. And for, I believe, five of your other allies, several of your other allies, I'll, I'll pop up the tooltip here. Um, for your allies and when you're in cloud rest and baneful and anytime you have a healing check, okay, where someone is reduced, their, their health is reduced and then they have a healing debuff on them. The most important thing is to stop them from taking any more damage. And the way to do that is by applying a shield. So what you do is you pop this whenever baneful goes out, somebody in your party uses it to provide the shield for them and all of their allies, as well as providing them with a healing buff. And then you can heal them out, out of the baneful relatively easy. Having a shield on so that they stop taking damage is the most important thing though and that's why we need bone surge and why we might want to have it we'll talk more about that in a second after that we have power extraction power extraction is a stamina morph of sap essence and what it does is surprise it applies minor cowardice which again major cowardice as we talked about earlier comes from mass hysteria minor cowardice is just a lesser form of that i personally don't find this typically useful it only lasts for 10 seconds Yes, it does reduce damage done, but you know you can only keep up so many 10 second buffs. And so I tend to almost never use this skill. However, if you wanted to do a little bit of damage, I suppose, or if you really needed to just reduce the damage done by a particular boss or mob, this could be a way to go. It's kind of an honorable mention, honestly. After that, we have guard. Guard, what this does, it, you actually have to front and back bar this, and then you place it on an ally, and it 20% of their damage gets instead transferred to you as well as giving you both a healing buff. So this is used whenever you have a tank who's maybe new or in a situation where they're just taking a lot of damage to keep them alive. You have to be careful that you also keep yourself alive since you will be taking a little bit more damage. 
But again, it's one of those skills that's crucial when you need it. And when you don't need it, it's not really a big deal. Uh, places like Sunspire, if you have your tank rolling under the dragon on Yolnikrin, this could be very useful there and plenty of other situations. Anytime you have a new tank, just about, it can be useful. It does have a range on it, so you do have to stay relatively close. If they go too far away, it will break. After that is going to be another situational skill. It's going to be Healing Ward. Healing Ward provides a shield for your ally. Whoever's lowest health is who it tends to go on. This can be problematic because it'll go on somebody who you're not looking at but uh, whoever's lowest health it'll, it'll put a shield on them and then it also heals them for some amount based on how much th that shield is left so places that you would use this are all those heal checks so sunspire if you're doing hard mode tombs absolutely crucial there it's very helpful even on veteran but it's it's pretty huge and pretty crucial on hard mode that you have this. Just keep in mind, you do need to make sure the, the shield goes on the right target, especially if you're healing Sunspire tombs. And if you do, like this is all you need. <laughs> you cast this on them, combat prayer, and you'll absolutely be able to heal them out of those tombs. If you cast this and it goes on a different target and you don't notice that, you're going to have, you're going to struggle a lot, especially with the new group, because there's a lot of damage going on and it's going to make the tombs impossible for you. So before you try Sunspire, certainly hard mode, you definitely want to have this skill and have it leveled up if you're going to be the tomb healer. After that, we have Elemental Susceptibility. This skill provides major breach for our allies. This is useful in a lot of different situations, but in places where you just need to debuff something. So Cloud Rest with the orbs, uh, sometimes in certain ads in various dungeons and trials where the tank can't, can't get to them, you can do it instead. And so that's why this is so useful. And then last up here, Concealed Weapon. Concealed Weapon provides us with Minor Expedition, which increases our speed by 15%. And that's gonna work on both weapons whether it's on our front or a back bar in the next patch. So that's really cool. So that's why we have it here. It's surprising how often that being faster can be helpful. Sometimes you want to run swift jewelry or something else, but as a night blade, we could just throw this on our bar and it would, it would serve that function for us. And I think that's it for skills. All right, let's move on and talk about everything else. All right. So first up here is going to be our healer setups. The first setup I'd recommend is running, especially useful in dungeons is running spellfire cure and Pillager's Prophet, and then you can actually run Pearls of Elnofe and Symphony of Blades. You don't need to run Pearls of Elnofe, uh, just so you know, they, they provide you with a bunch of extra ultimate whenever you heal an ally and your magic is under 50%. But if you don't need to get that sweaty, if you're not that worried, you're a new healer, you haven't farmed it up or whatever, it's not a big deal. Just run these two five piece sets and run Symphony of Blades that's totally fine. If you want to get a little bit sweatier and you're a little bit more experienced, then you actually can front bar and back bar. You front bar on your resto staff, spell power cure, you back bar pillager's profit, and then you run pearls of Elnofe and you can still run symphony of blades. Now you still have one extra spot. Usually you just fill that in with either an extra piece of pillager's profit or of spell power cure, whichever you can do. I usually run uh, pillager's profit myself, but if you do that, you need to keep in mind that spell power cure, the buff from that only lasts for like four seconds. So every Every like fourth skill cast, it should be on your front bar to make sure you're keeping up that buff on your group at all times. If you're ever dropping that buff on your group because you're staying on your back bar too long, then it would be better for you not to run Pearls of LMFA. Okay, so that's why we don't recommend that to newer healers something to keep in mind and kind of judge for yourself. After that, our second setup here is Roaring, Roaring Opportunist and Jorvold's Guidance. I see a lot of healers and a lot of creators recommending Jorvold's Guidance with all kinds of weird stuff. You almost never, there's a lot of different reasons for it. And you can ask me in the comments if you have a particular question, but you almost never want to run Jorvold's Guidance without Roaring Opportunist. It doesn't make sense. And again, there's a lot of reasons for it. I don't want to go into them all here, but it's generally not a good idea. It, it's almost always not a good idea. There might be one or two rare exceptions. So Roaring Opportunist and Jorvold's Guidance, you do have to heavy attack to proc that set. If you're on PC and you have add-ons, I recommend uh, Roaring Opportunist is what the add-on is called. And it'll put these two little numbers here. The first one is the duration of your proc timer because it can't actually be for the full duration. That's why we have Jorvold's to increase the duration of this buff for our group. And then the second number here is the cooldown timer. So you can't proc it again until that second timer goes off. So keep that in mind. Mind, that's what that's how you use rojo and you do need to be heavy attacking you also need to do it twice that's why there's the two timers because it won't hit everybody in your group the first time so you have to have the attack twice every 21 seconds to keep this up on your group for the maximum time and then with that you can pair if you want the master's resto you could run that on your front bar and then you're having to heavy attack with uh, rojo on your back bar and then typically you run that with spalder of ruin spalder of ruin you have to crouch to proc this and then it provides an aoe buff for all 
all of your allies, increasing their weapon and spell damage, but it also reduces your recoveries. So the reason you run this on your, on your Rojo healer is because you're usually already heavy attacking to proc Rojo, which gives you back a ton of resources. So running something like Spalder, which reduces your recovery, isn't as big of a deal. All right, and those are the two main setups. I, I recommend uh, SPC, generally speaking, for dungeons. If you want to pair that with something besides Pillager's Prophet, I would recommend Powerful Assault as long as your tank is not wearing it. And just keep in mind that you're going to have to have a skill from the Assault skill line, like our Echoing Vigor, on your bar to proc that. And if you're in a trial, you will need to do it twice. But typically, I recommend that for dungeons for a healer. Now, moving on to our, our traits. So our traits on our gear don't have anything to do with what sets we wear. Uh, we use usually want to have the same traits on all, all of our gear, no matter what set it's, it is. Okay. That generally speaking, that's true. So with our body, we're going to just have all divines and then all max magica, just the way to go. Only thing that really makes sense. The only thing else I would say here is that if you have a monster set, either one or two pieces, it can often make sense now to wear a couple of pieces of medium as a healer. It will make your magic recovery a little bit worse, but it'll make your stamina recovery a little bit better, as well as giving you increased critical heals. So uh, play with it yourself. It's totally fine to run all light, but I think working one or two pieces of medium in with your monster set makes a lot of sense, especially since you're using Echoing Vigor so often now. And if you have to dodge roll and whatever else, it can be a little bit harder to sustain the stamina than it is for a Magicka. And I think that's certainly true on a Nightblade with all of our ability to recover Magicka. For our weapons, as a just kind of a general setup, I would always run Powered on my front bar and then on the back bar Infused. Enchants on the front bar, you can vary. There's a lot of different things you can use. On the back bar, it's usually a Berserking enchant, which increases our weapon and spell damage. And as long as you keep over a wall of elements down, it'll keep that enchantment proc 100% of the time. Now, other things you could use here, there's quite a bit. You could run Decisive on your front bar if you're doing that kind of that sweatier Spell Power Cure, Pillager's Prophet with Pearls and Symphony. Decisive just gives you back more ultimate. You could also run Infused on the front bar if you wanted your enchantment to have a better effect. You would want to use a different enchant than what you use in your back bar because they'll just override each other and you won't get a, a higher benefit. Other enchantments you could run, like a weakening enchant, is often liked because that'll reduce our opponent's uh, weapon and spell damage, which reduces their damage done, which can also affect certain environmental effects actually are considered to come from the boss. So if you reduce the boss's damage, you'll reduce the environmental damage for your group. So kind of interesting there. You could also run a crusher enchant in certain situations. So, so just know these cards, they're never complete. There's always, you know, stuff you could run. This is just what I recommend for most people in most situations that aren't getting really sweaty, where, you know, whenever you get really into the harder stuff, you kind of custom build everything based on the trial because you want every bit of advantage you can get. And then for our jewelry, generally speaking, I recommend all infused jewelry. Sometimes you'll want a piece of, of, of swift to, for increased speed, or you might want something else if you're trying to do damage. But in general, three pieces of infused jewelry is generally the way to go. And then I again, generally speaking, would just recommend extra weapon and spell damage in chance. And that'll just provide you with the most heal. Now, oftentimes you'll need like a reduced magicka cost enchant on there as well. So usually I'll run like two increased spell damage and then to make sure that my recovery is okay, one reduced spell cost. If you're struggling with sustain, it's totally fine to only run like one increased spell damage and then run two reduced cost. You, you can easily swap out chance. It's not too expensive. So start with more recovery, more sustain than you need and then slowly move to less and increase weapon and spell damage as you get more comfortable. Landing our light attacks is gonna matter a lot, making sure that we have all of our passives, of course, is gonna be the other thing. Now, moving on to red CP. Uh, so Soothing Tide, Swift Renewal, generally speaking, I don't take these off my bar. From the Brink, uh, also kind of typically don't take it off my bar. And then you have a choice here of Enlivening Overflow, Hope Infusion, and then Salve of Renewal. I mentioned a couple of these because they're they're very niche, right? Generally in any group, you want one of your party members running Enlivening Overflow just because the extra recoveries. This is one where you just want to communicate with the other healer in your group if you're in a larger setting. If you're in a dungeon, Enlivening Overflow is really great to run because recovery in a dungeon cannot be very great, uh, especially compared to like trials. So your party might need it. Now with the current 
different Arcanist meta with everybody's an Arcanist, it's less important because they have great recoveries, but just keep it in mind and Lovening Overflow can be really important. Hope Infusion is mostly if you have like a heal check where like Baneful and Cloud Rest, where people's health are getting chunked down really low. Most set situations, your party is not dropping below 50% health. Just kind of judge based on your situation. South of Renewal, that's just a really useful buff in certain trials or certain situations where your party is getting debuffs on them. So for trials, I think of Veteran Halls of Fabrication could be a really, especially the first fight, could be really important there, uh, could save your group. That's why it's worth mentioning just for that. Other places, there's other dungeons and stuff like that too. There's so many, there's like, you know, 100 dungeons or whatever. So other places where you're having to cleanse your party, South of Renewal can also be very useful, but otherwise you wouldn't be running it. Additional blue CP that I don't always talk about, and I never have enough room on these cards to put everything so that's why i put the disclaimer at the bottom but <laughs> uh foresight foresight is a crazy good cp for sustain so whenever you drink a potion it reduces the cost of all of your healing spells uh, abilities magical or stamina by 75 percent meaning that it's a four to one ratio. So if you're in any kind of heal check and you know it's coming up, if it's gonna last less than six seconds, you can pop it beforehand and then just spam heals and not have to worry about running out of Magicka. If it's gonna last a little bit longer than that, you probably wanna do a couple of casts. And then when your Magicka gets a little bit low, drink a potion and then you'll be able to spam heals for the next six seconds for incredibly cheap. So this works really good in cloud rest whenever you get baneful. It works really well in any place as a heal check, uh, veteran Sunspire doing tombs. This is huge. Uh, it's a really undervalued CP for both healers and tanks. And I am so regretful. I think I have forgotten to mention this before, even though I've done like a standalone video just talking about foresight, uh, in the past, I, I think when I don't include it in my guides, people often don't see it. So uh, another one here is Rejuvenator that can also be useful. Uh, it just gives you more raw heals if you don't need anything else. There are situations where someone else is running Enlivening and you don't need Hope or Salve, and so you could run that instead and you don't need Recovery. Just more raw heals, but uh, Foresight is amazing. Uh, slottable Red CP here, Rejuvenation gives us a bit of extra recovery. Fortified gives us armor, which increases our resistances and makes us a little bit tankier, helps us. There's a lot of times where you're taking a lot of damage as a healer, kiting in cloud rest, for example. So being able to keep yourself alive and take a little bit less damage is, can always be useful. Expert Evasion gives you a free roll dodge once every about 30 seconds. It's huge, especially now that we're, we're running Echoing Vigor, our stamina it can get quite low and sometimes we absolutely have to roll dodge or we die so expert evasion is an amazing cp and i highly recommend it after that you can run really whatever you want uh slippery can be a really nice one that'll automatically break free for you there's a couple of fights main one is telaria uh, the last boss in dread cell reef that comes to mind but there's plenty of other places where you get cc'd and it'll break free for us also saving us some stamina and then spirit mastery which just increases our res time uh this is one that it's good for everybody uh and ideally if you're in a beginner group as a healer you're not doing any reses the the rule of thumb is that if anybody is there's a chance anybody's going to die because you're resing then you should not be resing you should be keeping everybody alive so that's kind of how that works but i'll be honest if you look up some of my streams I will absolutely res people. So Spirit Mastery is good for everybody to use in any kind of prog group. So I just want to mention it here so everybody knows about it. After that, we put 64 points into Magicka. It's the obvious, kind of only right choice. Just go for it unless you're trying to do a Stamina Healer build, which we're not doing right now. Uh, then for, for our Mundus, uh, I recommend usually the Ritual, which just increases our max healing. If you were trying to do some kind of uh, DPS build where you're also doing some damage, like in a, in a dungeon group, or if you're in a really sweaty uh, group wherever you're healing and your, your job's to do damage, then you would run the Thief. You could also run the Atromundus for more recovery, but in general, you shouldn't need to, particularly on a Nightblade. So that's why I don't recommend it here. Uh, for race, food and potions. So for race, uh, Argonian can be a really fun thing to go. You know, I, I don't, I like to play optimally. So I typically pick the, the best race. If you want a Magicka DPS or if you want kind of the best heals, High Elf is the way to go. Gives you recovery, gives you more max Magicka. 
it, it just gives you spell power. It's the way to go for more max heals. If you want a dual spec as a healer and as a DPS, then Dark Elf is the way to go. And the reason for that is they don't really lose anything on the DPS front and they work well as a healer. They have a little bit less recovery than something like a High Elf. Uh, after that, you know, a lot of people say Breton. Uh, I've talked about that in my complete healer guide about how uh, Breton actually isn't that good except for at the extreme and nobody needs that much recovery. So it actually doesn't make sense. Uh, although that's the common thought process. Uh, you just, nobody needs that much recoveries. Uh, so high elf is the way to go. But honestly, if you want to play a Breton or you want to play a wood elf, my wife likes wood elf. She has some wood elf healers. It's totally fine. Nothing wrong with it. Just realize it's going to change up your recoveries. And so you might need less stamina recovery or more magic recovery, whatever it happens to be, play the race you want. It's not going to be that big of a deal. You can heal everything in the game on any race of healer and, uh, and so, sure, some are a little bit better, but it's not going to be game breaking. Okay. It's not going to be what, what makes or breaks anything. I promise you, especially on a healer. <laughs> and then after that, I just mentioned a couple of useful sets at the bottom. We have Osazan, Archdruid, Nazare, a Black Rose Prison, Resto Staff, and then Powerful Assault, which I mentioned as a as a uh, dungeon set, good for dungeons. So. Anyways, uh, that's it for today, guys. If you want to know more about healing, I've got some more in-depth, deeper guides on the channel, so you can go check those out. But I appreciate you guys watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.